Hello, I'm the Angry Spork. Being a big Batman fan for so long, a bunch of these crossovers this year are going to involve the Dark Knight, much like today's review. It sees our hero join forces with a group he's encountered several times before, crime fighters in their own right, often scared but ne'er deterred. I speak, of course, of Scooby-Doo and the Mystery Inc. gang. Batman and Robin had two crossovers with the meddling kids in the new Scooby-Doo movies, which were more like a series of one-hour episodes featuring animated and real-life celebrities, including the Addams Family, Don Knotts, Laurel and Hardy, the Three Stooges, Jeannie and Babu, yes, she's supposed to be that Jeannie, Josie and the Pussycats, the Harlem Globetrotters, Phyllis Diller, the list really goes on. Proving the long-held theory of quantum physics that the focal point of a possible multiverse, and thus all reality, is Scooby-Doo. Go ahead, ask Neil deGrasse Tyson, he'll back me up. They had another animated encounter with the Caped Crusader, alongside Weird Al Yankovic, in an episode of Batman the Brave and the Bold. And it's that version of Bats we're going to focus on this time. According to the cover, it'll involve some kind of red phantasm while the mystery machine avoids giant playing cards fired by the Joker, riding in his car with... Some guy in a snake costume, and is that Mad Mod? I can't tell. In another first for the show, let's hit play and start taking issue with Scooby-Doo and Batman, the brave and the bold, to see if it proves to be a fun ride or makes us want to press stop. The titular dog and his buddy Shaggy are in a theater running for their lives from a puppeteer ghost while Fred, Velma, and Daphne set up a trap, pontastically called... The Marionette! Hey, I appreciate good wordplay. Sue me. When the ghost and his apparently independently able puppet arrive sooner than expected, they're scared off by Batman himself, who tells the kids to leave this sort of work to the professionals... Specifically, the ones that trained themselves to take the law into their own hands after a devastating childhood tragedy. But Mr. Incorporated insists they should stay when the ghost reappears. This vindictive ventriloquism ends now, you pernicious puppeteer. I do loves me some Brave and the Bold style heroic alliteration. Anyway, Fred tries setting his trap, but... Great! You just trapped Batman! I did? <laughs> cool! That is such an awesome reaction to have for someone like Fred. The ghost is eventually trapped. Because physics typically takes a back seat to a good petard hoisting. They begin summing up the mystery to themselves, which is really weird in context, since they should all be aware of the details already. I mean, at least have someone else around to act as the audience's clueless surrogate. Though it eventually turns out that it was all a test set up by Batman for the gang to join the Mystery Analysts of Gotham, which, despite being the first we've heard of it, is kind of a big deal. As they leave to start helping out a few cases, they're observed by the red figure from the cover. We then see the Mystery Inc. gang thrown into the Brave and the Bold opening theme, and it's pretty awesome. Extra points for crediting Bill Finger. If you don't know who that is, do a quick search after the review. He's definitely worth looking into. Some time later, Batman is foiling one of Riddler's thefts, only to find he's enlisted some help. Batman had the same idea, and after a fun fight scene, they make short work of the costume villains. Outrageous! He said the thing! The gang arrives for a meeting of the mystery analysts, finding their dilapidated destination and the puzzle that Daphne solves to grant them entry. Man, that is really bad haiku. Or good haiku. I can never tell. That was a haiku. I actually like this touch because it makes Daphne more than a pretty face. Sure, she may not be a genius, but she's clever and resourceful in other useful ways. They meet with the other members of the group, including Detective Chimp, Martian Manhunter, The Question, Black Canary, whom Fred is quick to crush on, and Plastic Man, risking a sexual harassment suit. Sure, it's for laughs, and Daphne barely sat down at all, but still. Common sense, Plaz! As the newest members, the gang gets their pick of next mission from an unsolved cases file. Velma eyes the only one in Batman's drawer, but he promptly denies that option. After Aquaman annoys himself into a place at the meeting, they get an alert at a break-in at a chemical storage facility, and the team is on the move. In a shot of everyone heading out, we get a visual nod to the original Scooby show. 
Even I can appreciate a fun callback like that, and I was never much of a Scooby-Doo fan. With one exception. Upon arrival, Batman hears something the others don't. But he's not crazy, not crazy at all, so he returns to the task at hand. They soon find the alarm may have been tripped intentionally, with the perps likely still inside. With the gang leading, they do like always. Split up. Looks like it's you and me, doll. Wow. Okay, now you are begging for a lawsuit, O'Brien. And you are married! Is this supposed to be innocent flirtation, or are you seriously hitting on her? Either way, unacceptable! Maybe part of it is my own cynicism, and maybe part of it is the influence of people who insist on perverting everything they see, but despite trying to be funny about it, I can't help but feel this is a kinda creepy scene. Anyway, the gang each take along a superhero or two, leaving Fred with Canary. Guess the only thing that can divert Fred's attention from his sometimes girlfriend being hit on by a shifty shapeshifter is a leggy blonde in fishnets. Meanwhile, Aquaman asks Batman about his unsolved case, but pointy ears ain't talking. Did you lose another Robin? Ho 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 ho! When he loses a Robin, you'll know about it. Velma and Detective Chimp find that an isotope has been stolen, while Daphne, showing surprising knowledge of Gotham criminal cases, finds out Plastic Man used to be a well-known crook, as well as his weakness to cold. Not sure why he just doesn't follow her out of the storage fridge, but maybe the cold messes with his brain, too. A mysterious voice calls to Batman, who then tells everyone he needs to play it solo, when the figure from earlier appears, calling itself the Crimson Cloak, and swearing revenge on Bats for his current state. It makes short work of the supers before standard chasing of the gang. None of you shall escape! Everybody, run! No offense to the writers, but I think it would have been a lot funnier if it went down like this. None of you shall escape! Everybody, escape! The cloak causes an explosion the heroes narrowly escape from. While the supers deal with the fire, Batman orders the gang to meet him at a malt shop at the corner of Spears and Ruby. This is another fun shout-out to a prolific animation studio with which both Bats and Scooby have history. After ordering chocolate milkshakes... Is Scooby somehow immune to the poisonous effects of chocolate on dogs? Or has he built up an immunity thanks to the careless pet ownership and gluttony of one Norville Rogers? ...met by Detective Harvey Bullock, showing him a photo of the mystery machine breaking into the storage facility they just escaped from. With their humorous back and forth of the definition of gang and keeping mum about their earlier activities, they'd be taken in handcuffs if Batman hadn't shown up. You know, for the upbeat, retro nature of the film's tone and designs, they do a really good job of representing Harvey as a committed, if rule-bending cop that doesn't much care for the capes. Gentleman Ghost, Clayface, Joker. Anyone who could do this is either an Arkham Asylum or Black Ape Penitentiary. And after some egging on, he reveals that in his first year he was investigating a teleportation experiment gone wonky by one Professor Achilles Milo. Try as he did, Batman only managed to save one of Milo's unwitting assistants, Wade Magny, while the other, Leo Scarlet, was pulled into the portal before it closed. Little side note, I really dig how this year one look has an animated series vibe to it. Shaggy suggests talking to Milo, but... He met his fate in a rodent-related incident a few years ago. That is an hilarious callback to one of the openers to Brave and the Bold. Also horrifying when you realize what Batman is talking about. Though he left the scene before it happened. Leo had one living relative, his father Sam, who's also a scientist. But apparently being a broken man is enough for Batman to scratch him off the suspect list. Struck with epiphany, Daphne rearranges the other assistant's name from Dr. Wade Magny to Edward Nigma, which completely flew past the world's greatest detective despite the many times he'd captured Riddler, knew his real name, and had to have unmasked him. Of course, clever as it is, anyone figuring it out is something of a stretch, since Daphne was clearly working off the abbreviation of Doctor. If she were a Doctor Who fan, they'd still be clueless. From there, it's off to Arkham Asylum, where, for some reason, Batman has Scoob sniff out whichever room is Nigma's. Bats drops off criminals there all the time. I'm pretty sure he could probably find one of the cells if he were actually blind. 
I, I know, they need to have the gang contribute to the story, but this just seemed off. It would have made a lot more sense if Scooby was independently sniffing around and happened upon Riddler's door for that little scare. It's not like he ever had the guy's scent to begin with. And while I did just criticize Bats for not making the Magni Nigma connection, the criminals in this world tend to have their masks kept on when they're locked up, so maybe that's a pass. Anyway, after solving a riddle and Shaggy and Scoob run off, Eddie reveals that he needed to build some supervillainy experience, so joined Milo's experiment covertly. The tattered piece of Scarlet's lab coat was buried on Arkham grounds. For some reason, does it have its own headstone too? They then go looking for their cowardly cohorts when the cloak appears, disappears, and cuts power to the asylum, letting the loonies free to encroach on them. Naturally raiding the cafeteria, Shaggy and Scoob run afoul of Harley Quinn and Poison Ivy, the former wielding a mallet from nowhere, clearly incorporating some of her contemporary elements into her Brave in the Bold iteration. Other villains advance, and when the guys spill their food, they naturally turn on each other, using the edibles as munitions. If they really wanted to menace some poor schmuck and his dog, they'd have them watch this food fight. I haven't seen it, but... I've heard things, man! With the inmates focused on each other, Scooby and Shaggy make it out with their lives and their lunch before losing the latter over their friends. What follows is yet another spin on the classic door routine that I'm pretty sure Scooby-Doo Where Are You originated, but don't quote me on that. The gang runs, Batman punches the crooks, and DAH! Unnamed Frenchman! He's worse than the Joker! Call in the Justice League International! Call the Justice League Detroit! Call every Justice League! They escape, sealing the inmates inside, and happen upon the Arkham Cemetery, where a crypt reveals the aforementioned cloth. Scoob sniffs out a muddy footprint for Bats to freeze for a souvenir, and they return to the mystery machine to find Bullock snooping in the back. Dang, Bill's got some serious upper body strength. This time, Bullock has a warrant and the rest of the mystery analysts, blaming Batman and the gang for the riot in Arkham. Chimp finds the stolen isotope in the van, and despite claiming they were framed, the supers seem all too willing to follow Harvey's orders on arresting the gang and the behaviorally suspicious Bat. I mean, sure, they've known Batman for years, trusted him with their lives, and as detectives are probably more than well aware of the prospect of evidence being planted, but Bullock? has a theory about cops thinking too much like crooks and then becoming crooks themselves. Airtight logic! Smokescreen allows them to take back the van and make an escape, since there was no time to get to the Batmobile, and Scooby's driving. But hey, Daphne doesn't seem to mind. <sighs> Groovy. Come on, Fred, commit to that redhead, or she will find someone else who better appreciates her uncanny word-scrambling skills. The supers give chase, but Scooby's haphazard driving lets them get away into no man's land. I guess in this reality, only part of Gotham was devastated by a fluke earthquake and cut off from the rest of the world. They should probably do something about that. They reach a dead end when Mr. Hyde and Bane show up, only to be confronted by Shaggy and Scooby posing as tailgaters, blinding them and driving off. There's no possible way that should have worked. Just go with it. <laughs> you have to love how precisely and expertly self-aware this movie is. We stop at a bar with obscure villains at the yin-yang, where Penguin toasts the Joker, the two of them together being a callback to the aforementioned Scooby movies. Though Batman did say Mr. J was locked up, but either the writers missed that, or he escaped during the riot and immediately hit the local pub. Here's to cry. <laughs> Let's hope that's the only reference we get to the killing joke. After the van busts through the wall, Bats puts himself at the wheel and drives off with the baddies following soon after, Joker's car hilariously overstuffed. When they get overwhelmed, Batman summons the Batmobile that instantly appears. You know, the one they had no time to get back to back at Arkham where it was left. Just go with it. I'm trying, I'm trying. Bats fights off the hitchhikers as the gang hops into the Batmobile, which goes from a two-seater to a four 
Plus cedar. Just go with Hey, don't press your luck. Throwing off their pursuers before encountering their other pursuers. I'm not going to spoil what Martian failsafe is, but rest assured, it is awesome. So the Caped Crusader and Mystery Inc. are finally able to lay low in the Batcave. It's full of trophies we've seen a mess of times before, fun callbacks to the 60s series, and even a Batman Beyond reference. And since Starfire got a turn, I think it'd only be fair if Daphne tries on Batgirl's costume. Don't judge me! Though the trophy case does kind of beg the question, where are those costumes owners? Probably best not to think about it, especially when they tune into a press conference featuring incriminating video all but solidifying Mystery Inc. as criminals. Batman goes to investigate while the gang stays behind to study the mud from the crypt and chow on dehydrated food. Returning to Milo's lab, Bats is joined by Aquaman and then the question, who is both determined the gang innocent and seeming to lighten up from last time. They find the teleporter rebuilt and the Crimson Cloak shows himself, whom Batman suspects is the father of the lost lab assistant. Rather than accept help from pointy ears, he ensnares him and the Sea King, knocking Question under some debris. Well, Question's dead, no doubt about it. Anyone semi-buried under rubble that loose is surely done for, especially in a kid's film. Back at the cave, Velma's analysis of the dirt hits a snag when it starts moving and forms a monster that chases them through the lair. Batman wakes from a nightmare to find himself still trapped, calling the Crimson Cloak Leo now. So he thinks he's the assistant? Can he not make up his mind, or did he just get hit in the head once too often? Or can he not make up his mind because he got hit in the head once too often? The teleporter is activated, and some strange twitching from their captor leads Batman to deduce the true culprit. We cut right back to the gang, who trap the mud creature and reduce it to dust. Daphne figures out who the villain is, leaving us on yet another cliffhanger as they activate Batman's cowl cam and realize he's in danger. As the machine is activated, surely spelling doom for the Dark Knight and the Atlantean King, the gang shows up, having borrowed some clothes for the occasion. Velma is Robin? Tell me the people making this weren't thinking Carrie Kelly, and you'd be a liar, sir or madam, a cursed liar, I say. And hand to God, I was writing this review as I was watching this for the first time, so when I made that joke about Daphne dressed as Batgirl, I didn't think they'd actually do it. Wait a minute. Killing joke reference, Daphne dressed up like Batgirl... Oh no. Run, Daphne! Run before Alan Moore finds out! Or Bruce Tim. The Hammers of Justice! They said the other thing! When the Crimson Cloak summons effigies of Batman's rogues, the Bat Gang do what they do best. Run and use the power of slapstick. Just when they're surrounded, they evade the villains, who reform the cloak, and he's hit with the Bat Dehydrator, to the same effect as earlier. Stop now to avoid even bigger spoilers because the police arrive to literally clean up as the gang and the Gotham analysts, with the surprisingly alive question, reveal the cloak was Clayface the whole time. And if you've been paying attention, that one was kind of obvious. But as it turns out, Basil Carlo was paid to do all this because he was promised a cure for his recent troubles keeping his form together. Problems with stable cohesion? He must be a story by James Tinney in the fourth. They reveal who the true, true culprit is, but I won't spoil that for you. Suffice to say, there is some danger that still needs to be taken care of. Velma instructs a couple superheroes to do something, but the others just spontaneously start doing other things, as if that's helping. And maybe it is. There are a few holes and conveniences that frankly aren't too different from any other Scooby mystery I've seen, but there is some serious cleverness involved when you think about it. When the day is won, a happy ending is had, and there's a dose of schmaltz as Mystery Inc. say their goodbyes, and Batman swings away while the gang gets to keep the costumes, I guess. So that was Scooby-Doo and Batman, the brave and the bold. And for what it is, <laughs> I think it's great. The old-school designs they've been using for the direct-to-video Scooby movies blends incredibly well with that of the Brave and the Bold series, making this the perfect iteration of the Dark Knight 
for one of many Scooby crossovers of late. The lip sync flubs a couple of times, but is otherwise fine, and the rest of the animation is about what you'd expect from the recent Scooby features or an episode of the series with which it's partnered. And I love how they got the voices from Brave and the Bold to reprise their roles, as well as Jeffrey Combs, voice of the question from the Justice League Unlimited cartoon. The story is a standard Scooby mystery with a supernaturally themed villain and a bunch of possible suspects and red herrings. But throwing in the history and characters from a Batman cartoon adds to the charm and possibilities the gang can explore. Though it is odd how Batman was sure anyone able to pull off the Crimson Cloak disguise was locked up and two of them were on the loose, which is kind of a big error to miss. The easter eggs and nods to be had are really fun, and the clever dialogue was so great I couldn't bring myself to spoil it all. It'd be best enjoyed first hand. Not to mention the self-aware humor of the normally serious Batman getting help from teen sleuths in terrible disguises that somehow managed to fool his fearsome rogues gallery. It really feels like a proper crossover, a healthy balance of the two properties they're putting together. Even though it is strictly a Scooby-Doo movie, you don't get too much of the dog or too much of the bat. The DC characters from Brave and the Bold are done well, mostly, and even Aquaman's small arc was thoroughly enjoyable, though I thought Martian Manhunter was kind of an uncharacteristic jerk to Shaggy, and Plastic Man being so creepy then forthcoming with Daphne didn't really go anywhere. If you liked Brave and the Bold, there's plenty to love here, but if you're not a big fan of the Scooby formula, it may not be your thing, as there is plenty of their style of shenanigans. But if you can set aside that distaste, or you happen to be a big fan of both of them, it's something you can enjoy again and again. Though, one disappointment is no post credit scene teasing a sequel movie featuring Weird Al. I'm the Angry Spork, and man, have I got issues.